I, th- I think you two are just dumb for not knowing to right click. <laughs> the new show seven. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. And I'm Dan. And we're back. And we've got some questions for you, as usual. You can send us those questions either via email, show at the new dot show, or on Twitter at Ask New Show. And do let us know if you want to remain anonymous, otherwise we might read your name out. And if you want to support creation of these episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash asknewshow. And thank you, everyone, who's supporting us. It's very much appreciated. And remember, you can get an advert-free RSS feed if you support us for $5 or more on there. So, the first question. What's something you own that has a computer in it that you wish didn't? Definitely the television. Like, no TV OS that comes on your TV is ever very good, right? Generally, I'd agree with you. Yes. I love the Apple TV. It's great. I've used Chromecast. It's great. I, you know, I've used Roku. Roku. It's fine. You know, it's a little slow, but it's fine. But uh, it seems like anything that's actually embedded onto the te- television is just immediate shit. Like it's so slow and awful and it's always trying to download stuff for some reason. What if Apple made a TV and called that the Apple TV screen or something? Honestly, I think I would hate that still because I want to change my television out for a bigger one and a better one in five years when they're incredibly cheap for 8K displays or whatever, right? Like, I'll keep my same set-top box and just upgrade the display. I think that's the problem is TVs are one of those things that a lot of people buy and keep for a fair number of years. It's not like a cell phone where you change it every year or every two years, or you're likely to drop it and then need to buy another one. Um, And it isn't something that sits in your pocket constantly. It's something you use maybe only for a few hours a day, if that, maybe only a few hours a week and maybe only over a weekend. So the motivation for them to make a good experience and keep that experience up to date is low because the second they ship that tv they've moved on to the next technology the next generation of pixels the next generation of uh, display technology and thin bezels and better speakers and better audio subsystem and whatever it is there's no incentive for them to keep it up to date which is why i think having a mainstream os like android on the tv kind of makes sense i still think it's garbage but it makes more sense than shitty TV OS made for the MIPS CPU by some random company in the Far East. Totally. But surely you can just not connect it to your network and use HDMI in or whatever and just forget that it's a smart TV. For the most part, but there's still like a lot of configuration that you have to go through to turn off all the smart TV stuff, or it tries really hard. Like there's a bunch of stuff you have to turn off that's like... um, you know, don't don't show the home screen when the television turns on. Just use whatever I have plugged in. And like, yeah, like you said, turn off network and all like it'll bug you. It'll be like, hey, we're not connected to the Internet. I want to get updates and like all kinds of stuff it's trying to do. There's also the, the amount of time it takes to boot up. I have a, a Sony TV that's not it's got the Sony operating system on it. It's not Android. And it's the generation before they switch to Android. And it takes ages to boot up. So if it if it powers on, and I've got everything connected via HDMI, if it powers on and then I press the input select button, it pops up a little banner that says, please wait. And it won't let me change input until it's fully booted the OS. It'll turn the screen on to whichever channel it was tuned into previously, but the UI to switch channels won't appear until a good 30 seconds to 60 seconds after the TV's been turned on. And then it'll let you rotate. So it's really frustrating if someone had left it on the DVD player channel or whatever, and you turn the TV on and then you've got this, you know, blank and you're like, I want to watch the telly and you just have to sit there and wait for effectively the OS to boot up before you can switch channel. It's shit. You're really not selling this idea of having a TV to me, you two, I must say. Well, if I mean, there are ways to optimize this. What I could do is use one of those HDMI splitters and put all of my devices going through an HDMI splitter into one HDMI port and never ever turn the TV over from that one port and only ever have it on that input select. And then when I turn it on, it's always on that input selected. And then when I turn on the set-top box or my game console or whatever, it'll just automatically switch and I'll be fine. But all I'm doing there is saving 30 seconds or so every time I turn the TV on. 
So yeah, I agree with Dan. The OS on these TVs is shite and it's awful. Well, the operating system on my washing machine is fucking terrible <laughs> and seems to just crash all the time and it just changes to random temperatures and programs and you have to turn it off and on again. So I was, that was kind of what I was thinking. I, I wish it didn't have a computer in it, but then surely it needs some sort of rudimentary computer to go through the cycle and stuff. If you ever look inside one of the old mechanical ones where they had a, a big fat dial on the right-hand side and you, as you turn it around, you can hear it going <laughs> crunching mm. and it's it's aligning a whole bunch of switches and there's this whole switch gear inside there that when you turn it around to a certain position, that's 40 degrees, you know, fast spin and so on. And as the timer circuit slowly clicks round, it, you know, makes contacts and breaks contacts. It's But it's reliable up to a point because there's moisture in there and eventually they corrode and die. Um, but yeah, you don't have to have electronics inside a, a washing machine, but all the modern ones do. Surely you needed to automatically order more Tide Pods from Amazon. <laughs> No way. I don't want any of that. Like Some people do have that, don't they? Appliances connected to the internet. Internet of shit. Yeah, I remember seeing a, a young girl whose mum blocked her Twitter account. So she started logging on in various devices around the house. And she was, or it was maybe not Twitter, it was Instagram or something. But you could see where she was signed in from. And it was like, mum's blocked my phone. And she was like tweeting from her fridge or something and you could see it was like <laughs> twitter for samsung fridge or something um you know sometimes it might be useful to have a computer in these devices but yeah often not i mean i do have devices that are connected to the internet that i enjoy like my air conditioning i like being able to set that from sat on the couch and my scale so that it just sinks into my health app and i don't have to manually enter my measurements for today like that's convenient but I, it's not really like a full operating system though since when did you need the internet to turn on your air conditioning from your couch which is in the same room it is not in the same room it is in a different room right but surely it's got a remote control Probably, but then I have to carry around the remote and, you know, know where that is. And mm. Could you, like, duct tape it to the back of your phone? <laughs> that would work. That's a potential solution. I could Velcro it and just make sure to put it on my phone whenever I enter the house. Yeah, totes. <laughs> so my I wish it didn't have a computer in it is uh, my car dashboard because uh, it failed, like, three times. The dashboard complete, completely died. Um and I had to get a brand new entire dashboard because it was some baked in processor that just fell apart and went to shit. And so I had to rip out the whole dashboard in order to make the speedometer work again because it completely died. So yeah, that's, that's my one is cars with not just computers in the you know, engine control unit, but computers everywhere all over the thing that is so terrible that those things aren't like completely separate from like the infotainment system like you'd think like the speedometer is critical that should be very very simple hardware yeah and it should all be <laughs> modular so you can just change them all out but that's not a very cost effective way of making it would you pay a one-off fee to use linux and if so how much and this is from neil why would you pay for Linux? Open source means free, right, guys? Yeah, of course it does. And just to clarify, what he meant was you pay it once and then you can use all the Linux distros forever. A licensing fee for the kernel itself? I, I don't know if he thought through the mechanics of how it would work. It's more of the principle of it. However that would work, I feel like that's like an incredible value for the person paying for it. Well, it depends how much they paid. If they paid a million dollars, then maybe it wouldn't be incredible value. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, you know, like that my whole livelihood is built on people paying for a distribution of Linux. So, yeah, of course, I think you should pay for a Linux distro. But how much would you pay if it was just a one off fee and that was it? You never had to pay again and you had access to all the Linux distros. How much would you pay? Yeah. Forever. I mean, that's hard because I'm thinking from the perspective of like, what's reasonable to charge for something that you pay once and then you never pay again? I don't know, like $300. But would you personally be willing to pay that? That's a tough question, I guess. 
I guess I would, but it'd be like, it, it would, if it was that high, it's like Photoshop, right? Like people would definitely pirate it. And then like, eventually you get the job or whatever, then, and then you're like, okay, now I'll pay for it. Cause I can afford it. Yeah. Like it creates kind of a weird relationship with your users to have a one-time fee. No, is the short answer. I wouldn't for the simple reason that it's not sustainable. If every single person who's running Linux right now all paid some one-off fee, what happens in five years' time when you know all these things need patches and you need software updates? A one-off fee doesn't continue paying the ongoing maintenance of all of Linux. So no, I don't I don't think it's a sustainable model. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't support that by paying it. I would rather there was a subscription model or some other way to pay what you want or some other way to do it rather than one-off payments. Right. But we're in a situation now where nobody pays or very few people pay and it manages to sustain itself somehow through companies paying for people to work on it and stuff. That wouldn't go away, but it would just have this extra money come into the system, surely. I mean, I'm not advocating this as the solution to anything. And I don't think Neil was when he asked the question. That's the problem. It isn't a solution. It's it's a one-time injection of cash to someone. Like, who does it go to? Like, what about all those developers who've given up their spare time to maintain stuff over the years that got us to where we are now? Did they get backdated payment of this one-time payment? Or what about the future people? How, how are they going to get paid? It's like having a one-time grant from the government to say, oh dear, we're in a bit of a problem here. Here's $1,000. That'll keep you going. And it doesn't. It's just it's just to keep you happy for a very short period of time. It doesn't really help anyone. Yeah. It's better than the kick in the bollocks though, isn't it? Well, if the two options are here, here is some money or I'm going to kick you in the nuts. Yeah, totally. But that's not how software is developed. You don't develop software by choosing between being paid or being kicked in the nuts. That's not how it works. It's just a turn of phrase, isn't it? And <laughs> what I mean is, it's better than not having any money at all. Surely. Maybe. That's arguable. Because, you know, people can't just like, unless you're just a contractor by trade and that's what you do and you're fine with, you know, oh, you're going to get this contract to work on this thing for one month and then you're on to the next thing. Like, that's not how most people work. So for most people, I feel like that one time payment would be like, okay, cool. Like, you, you can't really do anything with it. You need something that's more sustainable in order to actually do anything with it. Well, I would pay, but not very much, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> Probably 100 quid. What use is that? Well, that, that's 100 quid to whoever gets it that they wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah, but that doesn't help all the other people who made the thing. It makes you feel slightly better because you feel, hey, I'm helping. But it isn't. It just isn't helping. What, what helps is a, a more sustainable model where you contribute on a regular basis via a subscription service or at, like the elementary app center does when you, when the developer is putting in the effort in order to provide you with updates, chuck a few beans their way on a regular basis because you're clearly using the thing. Otherwise you wouldn't have it installed and they're providing value to you. So you should continue paying them. I downloaded a note-taking application and I want that note-taking application to continue to exist. So I paid a five-year license for it. It's free software and I could, I could have just continued using it for free, but I actually like the software and I want it to continue to exist. And so I paid a five-year subscription and in five years time, no doubt I will pay another five years because I'm that impressed with it. One-off payment, yeah, okay, it's nice, and they might be able to go and buy a book with it, but open source and free software isn't sustainable with random one-off payments. It, it needs subscriptions or regular payments of some kind. Yeah, when someone purchases a download, we send them an email with a link that they can use to just download again for free at any time. And when a new major version comes out, we expire those links and people will often email in and say, hey, my my link isn't working anymore. And then, you know, we kind of say to them, hey, you know, we really appreciate your purchase of the last version. It enabled us to do all this great work. 
the new version's out now and we'd really appreciate your continued support here. And, you know, we tell them like, you know, if you can't, that's fine. Here's a way to download for free. But getting people used to the idea of continuing to provide support so they continue to get value, I think, is is a culture that we really need to adopt. This episode is sponsored by Learn It. Sign up at automation.link and use the code the new show before the end of August to upgrade and get free access to a beta of a new DevOps training site called Learned. The site covers the entire DevOps stack, starting with the basics of infrastructure as code, and includes almost eight hours of lessons on Terraform, Ansible, Jenkins, and loads of industry tips along the way. If you're interested in learning DevOps, take advantage of this free offer by visiting automation.link and upgrade before the end of August with the code the new show. That's automation.link and the code the new show. Can you still appreciate the songs or work of someone who turns out to be a baddie? I'm thinking Gary Glitter, Morrissey, that sort of thing. I thought you were going to suggest Hitler was a really good artist and that is where you were going to go. <laughs> well, yeah. If if you uh, saw a Hitler painting that was really nice, could you appreciate it? If it turned out that Banksy was actually Donald Trump. <laughs> this is tricky. It's, the, you kind of have to separate the creative achievement that the person did from the bad things. So... I can appreciate the amazing work that Hans Reiser did on Reiser FS, despite the fact that he murdered his wife. You know, it's, it's an achievement, a technical achievement. And I can appreciate the awesome music that Michael Jackson made, despite whatever people have alleged that he did later in his life. Those are positive creative works. But when you start talking about, People like Jimmy Savile. Uh, he's given a lot to charity, but turned out to be a real baddie. And I kind of, I think the problem is I can't experience anything he did in a positive light because there's nothing that he created. Okay. But, you know, there might be he presented TV shows, but I'm not going to go and hunt down TV shows that he presented and watch them and enjoy them. I'm going to think, uh, Jimmy Savile. It's weird how there's a separation between people like Hans Reiser and Michael Jackson. I don't think anyone has ever put Hans Reiser and Michael Jackson in the same bucket, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I came up with this question when skipping through my music and the Smiths came on. I thought, oh, I don't like Morrissey anymore. His political views don't align with mine. So I don't think I'm going to listen to this and just skipped on, whereas I used to really like the Smiths before. That's weird, though. You, I mean, the, the music is great. And it was great. And the music didn't suddenly become bad because mm. one member of the band became a shithead. That's, that's mental. And I, I don't understand how, how, how you can draw that conclusion. That's weird. And it just feels sullied, like just spoiled. Like, I don't know. It is still good music. Don't get me wrong. But then I just don't feel like listening to it. Sometimes I will, but other times, I just think uh, I don't. I've got so much other music I could listen to. I'm just going to skip it. Are there any that are the opposite where there are baddies that you really enjoy? I don't think so. Also, who decided they're baddies, and is it only because of public knowledge that you know now? What if you are enjoying someone right now, and in three years' time you find out they're a baddie? Do you feel bad for enjoying it? No, I don't think so. Right, so it's not retrospective. It's only now you've got this distaste for that person. Now you're you're going to refuse to listen to their content that they made at the time when you thought they were a good person. Yeah. Yeah, I find that weird. It is a bit weird, but it's how I feel. I don't know that there's very many people in the world that intentionally set out to do evil things. I think most people feel like they're justified in some way of the things they're doing or maybe don't realize that the things that they're doing are horrible. And I think people that are making grave mistakes can still contribute positive things to society. Yeah. 
So I, I don't know that I can I can just say, you know, hey, uh, this person is now categorically evil and anything that they've ever produced is is contaminated in some way. I don't think I feel like that. But I, I wouldn't look down on people who did feel like that, though, either. I, I think it's probably a more personal thing where, you know, if, if you enjoy something, then that's just what you enjoy. And if you don't enjoy it, then that's fine, too. You know, we all have our personal preferences. It's somewhat reminiscent of the modern day cancel culture online where someone does something and retrospectively they're then seen as a shithead. Uh, for something they've done now and that taints everything they've done like every software project they've made every business they've been involved with you know, they're all now tainted and to the point where you know the business has to rebrand or you know change its name or sell out completely and you know assets be stripped or something you know is this this does feel like that kind of outrage i think it is definitely related to it yeah I'm not sure it, it makes sense to just categorically destroy like an entire organization for being involved with someone that did something that is known bad, you know? It seems a little a little bit overkill. Uh, I, I mean, you definitely, you know, if you strongly don't like something, exercise your rights as a consumer and, and people will take notice and distance themselves from things. And who decided who's the baddie and who decided what relative level of badness they did that makes them, you know, undesirable and you don't like their content anymore? Like, is someone jaywalking enough or do they have to have murdered someone? Or what if they, you know, divorced their wife and, you know, took away all her money and, you know, her ability to, you know, support herself? Like, what, what, what's the level of badness? Does everyone have their own level of badness or is it your own moral compass that determines that? Well, Morrissey is a great example because he's not done anything bad per se. He's just made some political statements that I profoundly disagree with. Right. And I haven't heard them, so I don't know what they are. So I'll continue to enjoy his music oblivious to whatever political statements Morrissey's made. I've heard people allude to it, but I've not actually seen it. So is that me being bad for not going and doing the research? And should I go and research all of the artists I listen to to make sure they haven't said anything that I disagree with so that I can remove them from the playlist and throw the CD in the bin? I guess something else to consider, too, is not just your your personal feelings but if you're in a position of some kind of power at an organization and um you're it's up to you to choose you know who you're doing business with in certain things and you find out that someone at an organization has done something despicable or made some kind of outrageous statements at that point like the decision that you're making it plays a part in that person's continued ability to have a platform, right? Like at that point, it does seem like there's come some kind of uh, moral responsibility. Michael Jackson's dead, so I don't really care now. <laughs> yeah, sure. But let's say that, you know, part of your job was to get someone to play a concert at uh, an office event. And then if you book the Smiths, are you now you know, supporting this platform of, of what I have no idea what he said, but are, are you pushing this, these ideals? Is this now something that you are using Canonical's money to support? Should we stop using all GNU software because of Richard Stallman's involvement in it? I think not. Yeah, that's, that's something that would be entirely destructive to a lot of people, right? We've done a lot of a lot of things that benefit marginalized people with this software, right? So not li like a personal decision not to listen to some music because you think the artist is a shithead. You're, you're not consuming that, that person's content. What if a leading open source luminary turned out to be a massive shithead? And what do we do? Do we go around replacing their code or do we just push that to one side and say their creative endeavor in creating that code is separate from the shitheadery that they did? You know, it seems different depending upon what type of creation they did. 
I think with open source software, it's different because that is inherently collaborative. Even if no one has changed that particular bit of software that that bad person wrote, whoever this hypothetical bad person is, it has still been added to with other bits of software, right? Like no bit of open source software sits completely alone. And so I think that's different somehow. Whereas a song written and sung by someone or a movie or whatever, they are there in your face. Whereas if if this bad person wrote one little bit of software that sits in the whole stack of GNU and Linux and GNOME and whatever, like I, I think that it's much harder to concentrate on that one person. It's much easier to forget that a bad person had something to do with it. What if it was a more high-profile project leader in an open source kernel? How about that? That's harder to dismiss as, oh, it's only a small part of you know, a much bigger project and that was just one shithead and we can root around that and rewrite that code or just drop it and fork it or, you know, fork it from before they were involved. If if this is a long-term project that lots of people have contributed to, but the project leader is the shithead, surely that's different. I guess it depends on what level of shitheadery that he's ascended to. But at, at a certain point, I feel like that there may be some kind of moral obligation to figure out, you know, are you continuing to support their ascension into further shitheadery or are you saying, hey, you know what, they need to step down and we don't want to support this. And if if they won't step down, then we need to figure out a way to not support them anymore. I, I find it weird that we have this separation that the, the creative artist who creates some music, we could just stop playing their music or the radio stations could stop playing it, or a TV program that's got some questionable stuff in, they just stop broadcasting it or delist it from Netflix. But a piece of software that's got a shithead at the lead, that's different because I need that to run my computer. I need (laughs) that to be able to serve my web pages. I need that. Whereas you don't actually need the TV program on Netflix. You don't actually need to listen to Michael Jackson's music. You don't need to do those things. You don't need to read that book but you actually need that software. And I think that's the fundamental difference is that you actually need it, whereas the others you don't. Yeah, I think you've nailed it. Why are ThinkPads so good? And this is from Adam. The new ones aren't. They're not so good. They, they, go, they go through phases. Some ThinkPads, classic ones from the past, are good through a nostalgic rose-tinted spectacles of I remember this and it was fun when I first got into computing or they used to be super modular or they used to have really good keyboards or easily replaceable parts and maintainable. But the modern ones have soldered on RAM, no removable battery, and the keyboard is nothing to write home about. So, you know, you could argue actually they're not that great. So... It's maybe just a looking back through the nostalgic rose-tinted spectacles is making people think they're better than they really are. Is it also because Linux support on them was really good traditionally, and you knew that if you bought a ThinkPad, everything would just work out the box, including all suspend and all of that, whereas now there's a lot more choice when it comes to Linux hardware. And so maybe that's the kind of hangover of the past where they were considered to be the machine to buy for Linux, whereas now you've got tons of choice. That was certainly a factor because ThinkPads tended to have a product range where the chipset didn't fluctuate a lot. So you wouldn't like get a model of the device. And then if you bought another one six months later, you could be confident that that there'll be the same range of chipsets and the same range of drivers that are needed for that for that machine. Whereas there are plenty of other manufacturers where you can buy two laptops with exactly the same model number and they've got completely different wireless chips or completely different North Bridge or some other component that's been swapped out because they used a different supplier and it was cheaper. Or at the other end of the scale, you've got Apple devices where a lot of the stuff isn't very open and so it's very hard to use. So yeah, a lot of people gravitated towards ThinkPads, and those are people who worked on Linux. And it always makes sense for you to run Linux on a machine that you know an expert, you know, who's working on Linux itself is running. Like the the joke that we had at Canonical was, 
you should buy whatever laptop Mark Shuttleworth or Jane Silver <laughs> was using because if they had one and they filed a bug, given they're running the company, chances are those bugs would get fixed fast. So, you know, whether that's true or not is another matter, but it was the joke that used to get told. Well, have a look and see what laptop Mark's got this week. Get that one. <laughs> um, and, and so it just makes sense. If lots of people are using them, then support is going to get better. And if you look around a Red Hat conference or you look around at a Canonical conference years, years ago, half the laptops would be ThinkPads. And so it's a self-perpetuating cycle of success when the people using them and the people developing on them, you know, are both the same laptop. I think I had one ThinkPad maybe as my first notebook, if I remember correctly, and it was a computer. And I liked it. And that's all I remember about it. <laughs> I don't remember it being especially exceptional or different from other computers in any way. Well, I've got a ThinkPad A20M that I'm going to give you, Popey, eventually, when we can uh, finally meet up. And that has got to be, I think it came with Windows 98. And that is still working. So it's well over... 20 years old it might have even been windows 95 i'm not sure but it's 20 to 25 years old and still works more or less perfectly can you say that about any other machines of that vintage probably not yeah you probably could uh i think there are certainly of that specific vintage of the windows 95 98 era there will be compact machines and some sony machines Sony ones are a bit plasticky, but you'll probably find some compact machines and some Toshiba machines from around that time, which may have survived. But because the ThinkPads sold in such volume, there's obviously a lot more of them and, and they tend to survive and people cherish them because they, like I said, because they love them. It's a self perpetuating cycle. If you, if you love the thing and you look after it, whereas if it's just a computer and you don't give a crap, then yeah, you might just lob it in your bag and not take as much care of it as someone who cherishes their ThinkPad experience does. Drop a television on it. Stand it up off your desk using some crayons <laughs> to get some better airflow. 